Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Friedman. I'm the inpatient medical director and a physician here on the team at CHOP Oncology and Transplant. Thank you so much for attending our Cancer Center Town Hall today. We're really happy to have you here. This is one of many in our series focused on you and your child and info relevant to their care. The topic for today is vaccinations in, the, in children with cancer, particularly the one we're all thinking about, most COVID. Our speakers today include Jeffrey Gerber, who's an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases here at CHOP. His areas of expertise include antibiotic stewardship and infections in immunocompromised hosts. He's also a principal investigator in the CHOP Vaccine Treatment and Evaluation Unit. Following him is Dr. Laura Vela, who is also an attending physician in the Division of Infectious Diseases here at CHOP. Her areas of expertise include infections in immunocompromised hosts, and she studies the immunology of vaccine responses. We're so excited to have them here today. Please use the Q&A function on the, the platform if you have any questions during the presentation, and we'll be sure to get to them um, with Dr. Gerber and Vela at the end. And we'll also field any other questions at the end as well. We really hope you enjoy, and thank you so much for joining us today. I now turn it over to Dr. Gerber. Thanks, Dr. Friedman. It's such a really an honor to be able to speak with everybody today. Um, Dr. Vella and I are just really excited to share with you what we have. As you can see, we've posed this title as a question because it still does remain a question whether or not COVID vaccines are um, are are indicated for children, but we'll we'll try to make the case that we think they are. So here's the overview. Laura's going to run my slides. I appreciate it. Uh, I'll talk. We'll try to give you a, a, a quick, brief assessment of the state of the pandemic. We'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 vaccines, more about why we should vaccinate children, and talk just very briefly about pediatric vaccine trials. There's not a lot there, but we'll we'll let you know. And 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 Laura is going to talk a little bit more about you know some of its speculation, but what we we think we know we hope to, to learn in the future about COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccines in immunocompromised patients here, specifically talking about cancer patients. The next slide, please. So just quick background, and we go back and forth. You've probably heard about SARS-CoV-2. That is the virus that causes COVID-19, which is the sickness or the disease. And so I'll probably, these things will look a little bit mixed, but just so you guys know, most of you probably know this already, but but this is how we distinguish the two. Most people just say COVID when they're talking about the virus or the disease, but that's the distinction we make. Next slide, please. So this is, not to go through this in detail, this is a snapshot of the New York Times. Um, you know, if you, it's, the, the data are, are, are really good. It's a good site to go to, depend, you know, what your, whatever your politics are, people like different newspapers, but but we get a lot of good, overview information from, from this data source. And as you can see, looking at the upper left graph, this plots reported cases in the United States over time. And, you know, we're now, what I'd say overall is that we're in a better place, but we're, we're, we're still not in the place we wanna be. So we're, we're past that giant mountain that we had in the, in the winter, but we're still sort of in a range of what our second wave looked like over the summer and much higher where, than where we want to be. I think and hope there's a light at the end of the tunnel. I think we're we're moving in the right direction. You can see in the lower left, we're still above 50,000 cases a, a, a day and still hundreds of deaths. So we want to be better, but, but, um, but, you know, we still have some work to do. And in the upper right, you can see what is really promising. We've got you know, almost 30% of people fully vaccinated, or over 40% of people have gotten at least one dose in Pennsylvania, we're at 50% at least one dose. And so as this builds, we're gonna be in, 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 in a much better place. So the next slide shows you cases over time by week in adults versus children. And this is something to really point out. And I, and I know that you you probably all know this, but it's nice to share a little bit of data to show 
the difference in adult cases versus child cases. And so I have, a, I have two slides that talk about this. The adult cases here are the light blue bars, the child cases are the dark blue bars. And you can see, if you go to the left early on, the earlier on in the, in the pandemic, it was really dominated by adults, only 2% or so were, were, were pediatric cases. And over time that has increased and we're, we're at the point where it's built to just over 20% of the cases are, are pediatric cases. And, and just so you know, about 23, 24% of the US population are children. So we're now getting close to adults and children being infected at, at similar rates. Next slide, please. This next slide really that does show, um, really illustrates the issue well. This is a disease of age. There are other risk factors. We've, you know, I'm sure you've heard about diabetes and heart disease and obesity and smoking, and those all play a part. But by and large, this looks at mortality, so death from COVID-19 by age, and the the rates of of death when you get infected with, with SARS-CoV-2 and get COVID-19 are fa literally thousands of times higher if you're an elderly adult than if you're a child. And so that's that's a good thing. Um, when you look down into the zero, zero to five and the six to 13, anything under 18, it's, it's really a good thing that, this, that, that our children are relatively protected. However, if we move to the next slide, um, it's and this this just summarizes a bit more. We still have a lot of cases, so we're approaching four million cases in children. We're now up to thirteen point seven percent of all cases. But the good news is fewer than one percent of those case, cases have resulted in hospitalization. It's it's about two percent of all hospitalizations, and less than zero point one percent of cases have resulted in death in children. Only nine in the state of Pennsylvania, and honestly, that number is actually really probably higher than the truth. Those are among tested cases. And we know we're only, you know, we only know who has COVID if you're tested and many children don't get tested because they're either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic or it just wasn't, wasn't thought of. So, so these rates are good. That said, um, you know, we as scientists and researchers and clinicians sometimes get lost in the comparisons, right? So, so it's all relative and relative to adults, kids get infected less and they, they die much less often. But still 300 deaths, and this is a bit of an underestimate because about five states don't report, we're probably looking at you know, 400 or so deaths in a year. That's, that's, that's a lot of deaths and, and we, we don't want any kids to die from this. So we just have to, you know, we, can, we can hold two thoughts in our mind at once. This is largely a disease of older, adults, adults and older adults. However, it still can affect children. Kids get infected and, and some, a very small percentage, but some kids can have, have bad outcomes. Fine, please. So what about kids with cancer? Well, you know, we, we just, you know, the, the, the synopsis really is we don't know. So for one, there are many different types of cancer. There are many types, different types of being immunocompromised even within a diagnosis, as you all know, depending on what stage you are, and then across different diagnoses. So that's one thing to consider. We just don't have a lot of data on the rates of infections and outcomes. So far, the data suggests that it, there doesn't seem to be a population of, of adults or kids with cancer at significantly higher risk of infection and disease. But, but again, I'll, I'll, I'll put the caveat out there. We just don't, we don't know enough. Uh, very little data in kids, not a lot of data in adults, even less in kids. We're encouraged that we haven't seen a flood of kids coming into our hospital and hospitals across the country and the world who are immune compromised, specifically with cancer, mm -hmm. with, with severe COVID-19, but we still want to remain vigilant about that. Next slide, please. So with all that, um, why why would we vaccinate children if they're infected less and if their death rate is so much lower well i you know i did allude before to the fact that even small amounts of deaths we we, we want to avoid those the, the calculation for adults is pretty simple you look at the risk of vaccination which is extremely low versus the risk of more morbidity and mortality from covid19 and it's a 
not in everybody's mind, but but in, in most people's minds, it's a pretty simple risk benefit calculation. This becomes more complicated for children. So as I said, they have less infection, less disease, much less death. Um, however, we move to the next slide. Kids can still get sick and they can even die. So I mentioned some of those numbers, you know, 300, maybe 400 in a year. We, we, we lose, you know, between 100 and 200 kids each year from influenza. Um, measles, before there was vaccination, we used to maybe 50 to 100, 150 kids would die each year. A couple hundred maybe in varicella is more like 50 to 100. So, so the numbers of, of deaths, morbidity and mortality in these other diseases for which we vaccinate and don't get a lot of pushback against are really on par with what we see with SARS-CoV-2 infection and, and COVID-19. Another important point is that you know a quarter of the of the U.S. population, and it's even higher across the world, are kids, right? So you've, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about herd immunity, and that I don't want to get too much into the into the details of that, but but you know essentially the more people we have protected either from previous infection or, or a better vaccination, the more likely we are going to curtail circulation of this virus, hopefully put an end to it. That end might be pretty elusive, but, but the more we get, the more, the more we have immune, the less likely this, this virus is to spread. And if you start off with a quarter of your population as kids, you know, it would really help to, to vaccinate children. I'm sure you've all heard about racial and ethnic disparities and in infection and in mortality in adults. This also has been seen in children. And so there is there, this is an equity issue trying to make sure that we immunize the entire population. And then what's really important, and I'm sure you've all experienced this in so many ways, but the dis disruption of social, emotional, and physical development of kids is so important. And, and this pandemic has, has done that so much. And, and here's a photo. Um, that I think really just captures this. This was taken really early on in the pandemic, you know, a kid eating alone in the in the lunchroom. And you know, sometimes people, you know, we we always we always have to get in sort of triage mode when when thing when when bad things happen, right? And of course, we're trying to save lives, especially at the beginning of this pandemic when we didn't know that much. But but this picture, and I'm sure this all resonates you with you, is is really meaningful for for kids. You know, they thrive, they grow on, on their connections with their peers and with other adults and, you know, school teachers, peers in class, playing outside in the park. And so this has taken a toll on our kids and we, we need to try to find a way to get them back playing and, and seeing each other and seeing their teachers. And then the last, um, the last piece of data that I'll talk about to make a case toward trying to vaccinate kids against this disease is this syndrome that I'm sure many of you heard about called MISC or multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. This is certainly a rare disorder, but it really makes kids sick. And, and you can see that in the United States, we've had now over 3,000 cases of MISC. And just to back up, MISC is a an inflammatory condition that people like Dr. Vela, who you'll hear from soon, are still characterizing that for some reason, four, five, maybe six weeks after what can even be a benign SARS-CoV-2 infection and or even a really benign case of COVID-19 can turn into an inflammatory disaster where your immune system just goes haywire and and causes a lot of a lot of harm and, and you can see even death a small number of deaths but still 36 deaths is 36 more than we want so the hope would be that vaccination you know right now the social distancing protection but ultimately vaccination would 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 prevent kids from getting this this uh, syndrome as well and so i just want to talk briefly about school this is a, a photo of of what you know some kids are experiencing experiencing in school right now just to make a little bit of a case because I do think it's it's on the top of a lot of people's minds has been for a while and it's something that we're it's been opening up more and more so just a couple of data slides on on school um, there have been some really impressive studies and what I'll say is the story has been by and large the same and that is that this 
virus if we use our appropriate mitigation strategies. So wearing masks, cohorting children, keeping as you know, keeping a, a good amount of distance, three to six feet, we can debate uh, debate about that, but you know, not on top of each other, avoid large assemblies, avoid large gatherings, both academically and socially. This this can be done. We can walk and chew gum at the same time and, and, and go to school. So this was a, a study that was published last fall in North, 11 North Carolina school districts, almost 100,000 children. They, there were seven, seven, over 700 community acquired infections introduced in the school, but actually only 32 of these nearly 100,000 kids were, uh, districts with 100,000 kids actually were acquired in school and there were no adult child to adult transmission. So pretty impressive for a school system where there was widespread transmission, actually rates even higher than here going on at the time. And then the next slide is a, a an article from the New England Journal of Medicine, a leading medical journal looking at Sweden. And, and in Sweden, they have the luxury of being able to look at data from all their kids. There are 2 million kids in the country. There were, at the time, there was a high rate of community transmission. And they found that the child death rate was unchanged pre and post pandemic. But importantly for this paper, what was unique is that they looked at school teachers compared to teachers in other occupations and they adjusted by age and, and sex and some other things that might be associated with your risk of infection. And they showed that actually the rate of, of severe disease in COVID-19 was actually lower for school teachers. And that really was attributable to the protections put in place in schools. And so, you know, I won't, I won't go through more data on schools, but the important point is that we can, even in, in times of, of high transmission, if we're smart about it and we get everybody on board and, and, and don't overdo it, can help kids not be the only one sitting at that table and to have some of these important academic, social, emotional, physical interactions that they so badly need. Next slide, please. So the, I just have a, a couple of slides talking about, um, you know, summarizing other folks' opinions on on school, and, and and I think I sort of alluded to this. You know, yes, children can spread this infection, but it's not a binary question. So just because it can be spread doesn't mean everything needs to be completely shut down. They don't spread it as well as adults. And we need to prioritize the reopening of childcare facilities. LMA goes with daycare schools. Um, without exception, safely. And this was written by Sean O'Leary, who's an expert in this, in this place. In, in this space. And, and just again, circling back, the impact of COVID-19 lockdowns on, on child health have been really uh, a sad and emerging story. The, the mental health challenges, the decrease in phys physical activity leading to obesity, obesity rates have, have been skyrocketing. Oral health, um, abuse and neglect, you know, unfortunately, there this does occur, and many times, in many cases, abuse and neglect is actually reported and identified in school when when kids can go to their peers, teachers, administrators, and talk to them about what happened, and they're not going to school, and so these these are being underreported. Vaccinations. I'm talking specifically about vaccinations against COVID-19 today, but vaccinations against all, all the routine child preventable childhood infections have gone down. And so we're hoping not to see outbreaks of things like measles. Um, people did well with flu vaccine this year. Flu didn't circulate mostly because of all the mitigation strategies from COVID, but we need to make sure that children, that everybody, but we think about children, that children get the health care that they need and and we you know again we can walk and chew gum at the same time and financial security is another one people have the economy has been disrupted people have lost jobs and that wreaks havoc on children in so many ways why please okay so let's talk briefly about vaccinating children against this virus and there's not a lot but i'll share you share with you what we know so first this is not just myself and dr vella um you know Jumping up on our soapboxes, the American Academy of Pediatrics and many others have have lobbied hard for getting to a point where we can vaccinate children. So talking about it being crucial, um, they wrote a letter 
to say that it's counter to the ethical principle of distributive justice to allow children to take on burdens during this pandemic, meaning getting infected or getting cohorted, cohorted not, not being able to go to school without the opportunity to benefit from a vaccine. And then the next, you know, the next point is that they urge careful trials with rigorous oversight. So it's not just that people are saying, oh, let's just give it to kids without testing. We want it for kids, but to get it for kids, we need to take the same type of resources that have been sent to adults um, and, and adult vaccination trials to make sure that we can find out how to safely and effectively vaccinate children. So the next slide just very briefly summarizes a little bit of data from, from CHOP parents, and I'll really be interested to hear what you all know, and, and you can, you know, we're, we're, we're going to leave some a, a chunk of time for questions, and you can put things in the Q&A, and we'll respond in both ways. But we were interested, others are interested to know what, what parents are thinking about potentially having their kids vaccinated. You know, would they do it? And if so, what are, what are they concerned with? And, you know, by and large, the, the concern, th those who were concerned, it was very similar to what the concerns were with adults getting vaccinated side effects. So long-term safety, were the trials pushed too, too fast? And, and generally parents were not concerned with, you know, the COVID vaccine giving the disease, which can't happen, um, that it won't work, that they worry about their kids getting needles, um, you know, over allergic reactions, time, cost, the vaccine is free. Um, so it's really around side effects. And so we need to think about you know, ma making sure that we're messaging that appropriately, um, talk about how the studies are assessing safety in adults and how that's going to translate into kids. And, um, but I would love to hear your all, all of your thoughts on what you think about that. So the next slide, it's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff on here. Um, this is the last one that I will talk about before I pass the, the torch off to Dr. Vela. But this gives you a quick, so I should back up and say there literally are, you know, dozens and dozens of vaccines, more than a hundred that have been proposed and are at some stage of experimentation. These five are those that are probably the most popular, um, aside from a vaccine out of Russia, the most wide, the most widespread use. And so I'll just give you a quick summary of what's going on in kids. So from left to right, Pfizer, Pfizer and Moderna are the mRNA vaccines that you've heard so much about and have been the most um, widely used in the United States. Janssen, which is a subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson, you can see in small letters there, has gotten quite a, quite a bit of press. That and um, AstraZeneca are different platforms. So they use a something called an adenovirus that can't replicate. So they aren't live vaccines, but they use adenovirus to deliver the, the the protection. And then the last one is called Novavax. You've probably heard less about that one. And that's a, a different technology where the technology just makes a bunch of protein and uh, and then that that elicits an immune response. The one common thread across all these vaccines, you might see the word spike in there, is that they all their goal and what they've effectively done is they all have your body make an immune response to this thing called the spike protein. And the spike protein, I showed a little picture of the virus before, are these little things that stick out on the surface and that spike pr protein allows the virus to get inside your cells and, and create this spiral of, of infection. And so they're just using different technologies to, to get your immune system to make a whole bunch of antibody responses to get your cellular responses and antibody responses to this spike protein. So they use different different responses. So if you just, I think I have some animation, if you just click just to some circles, yeah. So thanks, Laura. Um, I'm gonna take you down to, to the, the pediatric trial. So just to, to give you a sense of where we are. So focusing on Pfizer and Moderna, those are the two mRNA vaccines that most of you have probably heard about. Hopefully some of you have received. They are, the Pfizer vaccine is approved for 16 and up and the Moderna vaccine for 18 and up. And that just was a, the difference there was just how they, they set up their trials and how they applied for, for their emergency use authorization. That's what he raised there. Both companies have completed 
clinical trials in adolescents. So Pfizer did 12 to 15 year olds because they had already been, they're already approved for 16 and above. And Moderna has done 12 to 17 to, to fill the gap because theirs is only approved for 18 and above. You may have seen in the newspaper that Pfizer announced a press release that they had really good results from their, um, from their 12 to 15 year old vaccine. They haven't actually shared the data yet. They've applied for emergency use authorization. I'm actually going to see the data on Friday um, for, on a, for a committee that I'm on. But, but what they have published is that in a smaller sample, it looks like it's, it's highly effective, 100% effective and and has a similar safety profile so the usual side effects arm hurts feel a little tired small percentage get a fever but and so that that vaccine for 12 to 15 my hope and we, you never know but my hope is that in the next maybe even two to four weeks we might hear something about about that that uh vaccine being approved which would be wonderful for our you know you could have all of high school and maybe seventh grade it up could be could be vaccinated. And, and I didn't mention before, you probably know this, that although kids, generally speaking, are, are um, less vulnerable to infection and severe disease, all kids aren't created equal, right? We're comparing, you know, six-month-olds to 18-year-olds. Those are very different. And the older you get, the more you can transmit virus and, and a little sicker. So the older ones are, are where we want to go. Moderna has completed their trial. They haven't had their press release. I think they're probably maybe just a month or so, month or two behind. Um, Pfizer, but I expect that by the summer we we should be able to start vaccinating 12 year olds and up, which is great. The younger kids and the next just below those for both Pfizer and Moderna are going to be a little bit more delayed. Both have started trials in under 12 year olds, actually down to six months. Both have 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 started their trials both both in March. It just takes some time because they have to do something called dose finding. So they, they, they take the, even if it's a, you know, for example, the Moderna trial is six months up to through 11 years of age. They start between, you know, six year old and 11. They give them a dose, a low dose and then a little higher dose. Then they go down the next age category within that. So it takes some time. I suspect those trials will be completed. Well, they take a year. To 18 months to complete, but you, they could potentially file for emergency use authorization by the end of this year, early 2022. So I think under 12 year olds won't be until, you know, probably getting vaccinated until early 2022 at best. Um, but it's nice to know that those are, those are moving forward. Um, right now, those trials, just to, just to, just to, as a quick teaser to what Dr. Bell is going to talk about, they, don't include children with cancer, but there will be trials moving along. I know multiple companies have trials planned for immunocompromised populations, uh, and Dr. Vela and myself to some degree will, will likely be you know, involved to some degree there. So I will stop talking right now and pass it off to Dr. Vela, friend and colleague, expert in pediatric infectious diseases and, and human immunology to talk a little bit more uh, the next few minutes. Thanks so much. Great. So, I, you know, I wanted to take over from Dr. Gerber and, and really address some of the questions you all may have um, about vaccination, especially in kids who have cancer. Um, but to preface it by letting you know, as, as Dr. Gerber alluded to, that um, we, we don't have as much information as we, we wish we did. Um, and so, not only do we not know um, how vaccines are working with children with cancer, but adults with cancer, um, because they weren't included in the trials, really only started receiving vaccines in, in, in this country in, in late January, early February. And so we don't yet have data about how well those COVID-19 vaccines work in adults with cancer. Um, we will hope to uh, soon have data about how well their immune system is reacting, um, and eventually we hope to have the most important data, which is how well they are protected from infection and from severe infection. Um, and when we think about how well a vaccine works and whether to give a, a vaccine, just as Dr. Gerber mentioned, we sort of balance the, the risks and the benefits. Um, in uh, kids with cancer and adults with cancer, 
we avoid uh, vaccines that have live virus because we worry the immune system isn't going to be able to handle the live virus. Uh, but here, these vaccines do not have the SARS-CoV-2 virus in them at all. And so from a safety standpoint, we um, aren't worried about uh, harms of, of the vaccine in, in that setting, particularly in somebody with uh, cancer versus a, a typical immune system. And instead, we're really focused on the other side of that balance about how well uh, the vaccines will work and what the benefits will be to um, adults and particularly children with cancer. So what we, um, what we do know is that some cancer treatments can reduce how well vaccines work. Uh, and as Dr. Gerber mentioned, and, and you all know, many different types of cancers comes with many different types of treatments, and the immune system can be affected differently depending on which treatment is being used and where in the course of treatment a child is. Um, and, you know, even though we have sometimes information that, that um, treatments that bring down the immune system can lower how well a vaccine works, when that vaccine is safe, like is the case in the influenza vaccine, we still give that vaccine because even if it doesn't work perfectly, um, our hope is that any protection is better than no protection. And so when vaccines are safe, we um, typically opt to give them. And so once we are, you know, where we hope to be with the 12 to 15 year olds this summer, and um, next winter with uh, younger children, once a child is eligible for vaccination according to uh, the FDA and the CDC, the concept of the best timing of that vaccination, you know, when a child's immune system may be best uh, able to respond to that vaccine is one that um, we would recommend you have with your care team because they may say, get it as soon as you can. They may say, let's wait two weeks, let's wait four weeks. And, and those are um, important discussions to have as we all try to uh, ensure our children can be as protected as possible. So another question that we have come up a lot um, within our hospitals, whether children with cancer or any immunocompromising condition could have tests to see if that vaccine worked. And so I think many of you may know that um, initially when we didn't have the PCR tests that from the nose very available, there were a lot of tests being used to look for antibody responses to see if somebody already had COVID-19 infection or SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so there's been a lot of question about whether we should use those tests to ask whether a vaccine worked in someone um, so that a parent might say, okay, my child has been immunized. Can we get a blood test to see if it worked? Um, and, and right now, the, the answer is no, not, not yet. So the, the tests that we have, they may tell us that there are antibodies against the SARS-CoV-2 virus after vaccination, but we actually don't have a test that lets us know whether that vaccine or those antibodies actually protect someone from infection. So when you see um, the studies that say a vaccine is 94% effective or 100% effective, what that's measuring is not the immune response in the blood, but how likely someone was to actually develop symptomatic uh, COVID-19. And so what we measure in the blood, we don't necessarily know is completely tied to whether the vaccine is providing protection. So we worry that if we get a result that has a, that has a positive test, so somebody has antibodies in their blood after vaccine, we worry that that person may be protected, but maybe, they're not, and it's a false sense of security. And on the reverse, somebody could maybe not have a very strong antibody response in their blood after vaccination, and we don't know yet whether that means um, that they have less protection. But until we have more information right now, we are not recommending that um, tests be used to assess whether a vaccine has worked in somebody with um, immune compromise. Uh, but, but our goal is to get that kind of information and so we and others across uh, the country and, of course, across the world for this pandemic will be studying um, how well COVID-19 vaccines work in people who are receiving treatments that affect the immune system. And so hopefully over the next several months and certainly in the next year, we'll have a lot more information about how uh, these vaccines uh, work across many different populations and many different types of immune systems. Um, although, as, as we mentioned, um, because everybody is so different, those discussions uh, 
are really going to be on a case-by-case -case basis with your uh, care team. So uh, given that we can't know exactly how well the vaccines are going to work in everyone with different immune systems, the question is what precautions should kids with cancer take after vaccination? And that's another uh, discussion to have. It, it may be that when you're hearing all the news announcements um, about uh, what can be done after vaccination, you know, those, those public health messages are really being targeted to um, the co concept of a normal immune system. And so when immune system is less normal, then we may want to uh, rely on some uh, measures in large crowds, such as masks, or we may really hope that the rates of the virus in the community drop lower, so even people who aren't as well protected by vaccination can still be protected by uh, the immune systems of those around them in that concept of, of herd immunity. And so while we're waiting to get all of this information about how well these vaccines work in many different types of immune systems, one of the most important things we can all do in our families and in our communities is to make sure that everyone we know can be encouraged um, to receive COVID-19 immunization if they are eligible. And so what I have listed here is the, um, the last part of our uh, presentation is just a link. Um, and as we mentioned, we'll be happy to answer questions, but we also wanna make sure that as, if you, as you guys have conversations with your family members and your community members about whether they should or should not receive immunization, um, and as people are sifting through all the reams of information and, and often misinformation that are available online, um, we highly recommend this particular link and resource from our uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia Vaccine Education Center that goes through many frequently asked questions about COVID-19 immunization, the different types, the risks you may hear about, and then for um, a lot of the pieces of information that may actually be rumors and may not be true, and, and the things that may be true and may not be rumors, all of those major topics are gone through in detail on this website and would be great resources for uh, you and, and the people with whom you're having conversations about uh, immunization. So uh, with that, I think uh, we will stop and, and be happy to, to take any of your questions. Thank you guys so much for a wonderful presentation today, a very informative. Um, there were some questions in the chat box that I know we've been hitting on, but just to pose them publicly, um, question was, do you expect the recommendation in transplant patients once there's approval for the 12 to 15 year age group? And so is that question asking, you know, if we typically immunize children a certain number of months after transplant, would the COVID-19 vaccine be included in that? in that series. In adults right now it is. Um, and so I, I um, ask you, Dr. Friedman, whether uh, what your conversations have been in oncology, but I, I wouldn't expect it to be terribly different. Correct. And so we are approaching the COVID vaccine as we are the influenza vaccine. We are not using the parameters that we check the immune system very specifically for, for the general childhood vaccines. We are considering it an important vaccine to do it on an expedited basis. And so any patient who's over 100 days out from transplant, um, who is otherwise well and in the age group of the approved vaccines would be made eligible. Um, and then just from a higher level, a lot of people are probably wondering, how would I get contacted? How would I know if my child is eligible? Where should I turn? A lot of these questions are answered on the CHOP website and the Cancer Center link that's provided here. Um, if your child is available and CHOP has enough vaccine to give, you will actually be contacted in order to make an appointment for that vaccine. And so be, be sure that you're checking your MyChop, um, your emails, your phone calls from our center uh, if those become available. But again, we're handling the COVID vaccine like we would the flu vaccine, knowing that it's critically important to give to the age groups um, and earlier than we would for other childhood vaccines. Um, again, I do draw your attention to the link that's um, there in the chat. There's a lot of wonderful resources on the CHOP website, and again, linked through the Cancer Center website can bring you there uh, to answer many of these questions. Are there other questions that we can answer for you? Um, or maybe our experts have answered them all. 
I think the key that I would just emphasize as a physician in this field is that the information is constantly changing. And, you know, things that get put out today may be different tomorrow. And that's why we're so grateful for all your flexibility and um, being interested in this topic and, and reviewing the website. As things change, we will bring you that information and know that we're all learning this together as time moves on. There are no other questions in the chat box. Oh, there is, here we go. Um, Ms. Slocum asked, um, is there any concern that the mRNA vaccines would affect kids with cancer since most of the data and information seems to be geared towards non-immunocompromised children? Maybe one of you could just speak about, again, reiterate the mRNA technology and sort of what it does and what we think it does. I'm gonna ask Dr. Bella to take that. She's, uh, she's more qualified. Hardly, but um, no, so we, we don't have any reason to think that uh, children with cancer are going to have a different risk profile from the mRNA vaccination. Um, we've been really reassured by the vaccine program uh, that's occurred in adults, and, and it's occurred uh, now in adults with many, many different types of immune systems, including adults with cancers, many different types of cancers, um, and, and all, uh, all sorts of um, chronic health conditions that even some we don't see in pediatrics. And we have not seen a safety signal that worries us in, in adults. And so we would expect that just as these vaccines um, safely help the body respond to that, sp uh, that spike protein, that there shouldn't be any reason that that safety profile would, would shift in children. So we feel fairly comfortable that, that these data will, will likely be um, uh, reassuring for us. Yeah. Yeah, I would just add to it. I mean, the nice thing about it not being a live vaccine is it's possible they won't work as well and to, to protect, but we, yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Bella. We don't have any reason to believe that uh, they'll cause any type of side effects. And sometimes, I don't know if, you know, I don't want to get into a can of worms here, but but the RNA, which sounds like DNA, gets sometimes people concerned about genetic material going into the body. You know, RNA is, um, for your body is, full of lots and lots of different RNA. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't go backwards and go into the nucleus and do anything to your DNA. It uh, it actually degrades pretty darn quickly. And that's why they have to be really careful to in, in its delivery. So it's really, uh, I mean, it's it's been a revolutionary technology that, that's, um, and, and so far, and of course we always want to, so theoretically, there weren't those concerns, but having now, we have the luxury of now literally hundreds of millions of people have received these vaccines and nothing, no vaccine that I've ever heard of has been so scrutinized. So it's nice to see uh, the safety profile and effectiveness of these RNA vaccines. And just to echo that, I think that with any patient who's gotten therapy that can make their immune system a little bit suppressed, there's always the chance that they don't respond as strongly or robustly as other patients would. But there's no harm in, in the trying and protecting as much as we can. Um, that certainly outweighs the avoidance of the vaccine, um, which is could cause significant problems. Uh, the disease itself could cause significant problems. And so we are in favor absolutely of vaccinating our patient population. I agree. And that's the same for the flu. We know that not everybody's gonna mount the proper response, but we feel that the protection is more important. Are there any other, oh, I do see another question that popped up. Or, um, Somebody was asking just about these references and resources, and I just want to make everybody aware that a, a version of this uh, recorded power, um, slideshow and um, presentation will be on our website. So if you want to review it again in the future, I'm certainly able to do that. Um, but if there are no other questions at this time, um, oh, actually, here we go, late breaking. My daughter's in the middle of her revaccination schedule post-transplant. Should we hold off on getting the COVID vaccine until after she has been fully revaccinated? I'm happy to hear what our vaccine experts think, but as a transplant physician, I would say if it's available and we have it, I would give it. I agree. Yeah, I think that. Yeah, I agree. I think there are some limitations about the the number of days between any other vaccine and the COVID-19 vaccine, um, and so right now the recommendation is that you wait about two weeks between any one dose and a COVID-19 dose. So if you're in the middle of a series, you just may want to talk about your care providers about how to space that out. 
but hopefully uh, in the next year or two, we'll be giving along with everything else, uh, just like we, we typically would do. But I, I absolutely, uh, if your care team is for it, we're all for it. Yeah, and you're describing a sequence it in approach instead of waiting to the entire primary series is done and then doing it. Correct. So wonderful. Yeah, you might see, uh, you, you might hear some new language coming out soon about um, spacing out these vaccines. It's, it's obviously a hot topic and there's really no reason because it's not a live vaccine to do the spacing out of an abundance of caution. The clinical trials and CDC has said 14 days, but that's been a hot topic among the, the committees that that review and make recommendations. And they're recognizing the issue, you know, that Rachel just brought up that can affect kids with chronic diseases and, and kids who don't have chronic diseases just going to the doctor to get their vaccines. The more complicated we make it, the less the less vaccine exposure we're going to get. And so I'm I'm optimistic that those recommendations are going to be loosened. Thank you guys again so much. If there's no further questions, we're going to close out this um, series today and look forward to hosting additional town halls in the future on topics pertinent to your children. If you have any suggestions for ideas you'd like to see covered, certainly reach out to us at the Cancer Center. And again, thank you so much, Dr. Gerber and Vela, for joining us today. Thanks so much. Stay for safe, everybody. You bet. Right. Stay safe, everybody. Take care.